Iran attacked Israel again. But why now and what does it mean? You may have heard people talking about an idea called escalating to the escalate. De-escalation through escalation. De-escalation through escalation. We recognize that at times military pressure can enable diplomacy. Over the last 12 months, while Israel has pursued a horrific war in Gaza, killing tens of thousands of Palestinians and leaving most of its population homeless. There's been this bizarre game of tag playing out across the region, pushing rival powers into a confrontation they say they don't want. Israel bombs Lebanon to prevent an escalation with Hezbollah. Hezbollah fires rockets at Israel to prevent a genocide in Gaza. Iran fires missiles at Israel to prevent an escalation with America, while America keeps sending bombs to Israel while trying to prevent an all-out war in the region. If it sounds confusing and insane, it's because it is. But have these tactics actually worked or has it instead pushed all of us closer to the brink of World War III and risked the lives of millions in the process? Spoiler alert, it's probably the latter. My name is Mohammed Hassan and this is The Big Picture. On Tuesday, more than 180 missiles were launched into Israel in what Iran says is its long-awaited response to the assassination of... Wait, there's a list. Hezbollah commander Fuad Shukr, Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah, Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh, and about 12 other Hezbollah and Iranian commanders. This was the second time Iran sent Israel and the wider region into a panic. Back in April, it launched hundreds of drones and missiles into Israeli territory. But like in April, this attack wasn't designed to cause any real damage, rather to create a spectacle, a show of force that told Israel to back off. Iran's new president, who was inaugurated the same night that Ismail Haniyeh was assassinated in Tehran, said as much, tweeting out this. Let Netanyahu know that Iran does not seek war but it stands firmly against any threat. This was exactly what his predecessor said back in April. Quote, we are not seeking tensions, but we will give a severe response if the Zionist regime makes another mistake. Hezbollah's late commander, Hassan Nasrallah, had tried to do the same thing. Since October 7th, he directed Hezbollah to launch thousands of rockets into Israeli territory. In August, he even aired footage showing his drones flying over Tel Aviv and Haifa, promising that he had rockets that could reach any Israeli city and that his on-the-ground forces were ready to cross the border at a given moment and face the IDF. And many had believed that to be a bluff, a show of force to tell Israel, hey, you don't want to mess with us, and we don't want to mess with you. But in September, Israel escalated this to another level, exploding thousands of pagers and walkie-talkies all across Lebanon, and then bombing Hezbollah's headquarters in Beirut, killing Nasrallah and a group of his senior leaders. It's continued to bomb Lebanon every day since then, killing close to 2,000 people and displacing a sixth of the country's population. Every day, their puppets are eliminated. As Muhammad Def, as Nasrallah, there is nowhere in the Middle East Israel cannot reach. There's nowhere we will not go to protect our people and protect our country. Part of Israel's military strategy is to try and undo the damage caused to its military invincibility on October 7, when Hamas launched a devastating attack on its security apparatus as well as its civilian population. The failure of its military intelligence to prevent the attack deeply wounded its self-image and put a massive target on its back in front of its regional enemies. At least, that's how Israel sees it. The logic goes that the only way to prevent anyone else from going after it, whether that's Hezbollah or the Houthis or Iran, is to respond with overwhelming force to escalate on all fronts. But it had tried this before, back in 2006, when it unleashed hell on Lebanon for 34 days in response to the kidnapping of two of its soldiers by Hezbollah. It was forced to withdraw by the UN. Its own experts concluded that it failed to achieve anything in the war, and Hezbollah has only grown more powerful since then. But despite this, former Prime Minister Ahud Olmert maintained for years that the brutal war he had waged actually helped protect Israel in the long run. The war in Lebanon was the greatest achievement, military achievement that in the history of the State of Israel and the history of the wars between Israel and the Arab countries. The first time that a result of a war for seven years now, we have a quiet front there was not one bullet shot from the north to the state of Israel since the last day of August. Because we have created a deterrence in the war in Lebanon. But now the man in the eye of the storm is its current prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. 
having been blamed by much of his public for the failure of October 7th after surviving months of escalating protests calling for him to resign and mounting corruption cases that could very well land him in jail the moment he steps out of office. Netanyahu has pursued a policy of prolonging the war in Gaza and now in Lebanon as a means of keeping himself in power. If the war never ends, then he never has to step down. And if he can show his own public how powerful Israel is under his watch, then maybe they'll change their minds. And you know what? It's kind of worked. New polling now suggests that despite 80% of Israel's public wanting him to resign earlier this year, if there was an election held today, his party would most likely win again. From his vantage point, the more he's escalated the war, the more his personal problems have eased. It gives him also a, a time to go wild with his legal reforms because while everyone is concentrated in Gaza, nobody cares about more changes that he's doing in the legal system of Israel. So altogether, the last thing Netanyahu wants is a deal now, a ceasefire. He wants this war to continue. His personal survival is the only consideration. But this is much, much more serious than just an election poll. And Netanyahu isn't the only leader in the region that has to face his own public. Iran's government, having crushed a sweeping countrywide anti-government protest movement in 2022, has been taunted again and again by Israel. Hezbollah, its most powerful ally in the region, and the proxy militia that it has used as a deterrence against any attack on its nuclear facilities, is now under heavy bombardment by Israel. And its other proxy, the Houthis, having spent the last year targeting Israeli-linked shipping vessels in the Red Sea, is now under bombardment on Yemeni soil. What's worse, Iran's spectacle of force back in April was meant to prevent Israel from provoking it again, but it clearly hasn't. And this has then put the Iranians in a bit of a bind, a bit of an escalatory trap for them. Because prior to this, they had the policy of strategic patience. They were taking a lot of hits. Recognizing this, the Israelis then kept on pushing and pushing and pushing. But once they responded to that, they have now put themselves in a position in which they're under far more pressure now to respond to the killing of Hania than they would have been had they never responded to the April attack. Because now they've, they've abandoned strategic patience, they can't go back to it. Immediately after the missile attack on Tuesday, Israeli officials vowed to respond with force. Let me be very clear, we will defend our people. We will act. Iran will soon feel the consequences of their actions. The response will be painful. And Iran's Revolutionary Guard responded to that response, saying any attack by Israel would be met with an even more powerful one from Iran. See what I mean? We're going around in circles. Except this circle is more like a downward spiral. Perhaps nothing sums up the situation more than this one man. Antony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, has spent the last year raking up air miles, flying frantically between Israel and the Arab world. His aim was to try and talk everybody down from reacting to what Israel is doing in Gaza and what many human rights voices, including the UN Special Rapporteur, have called a genocide. And this comes at a time when the Biden administration is not only facing a tough election year, but it's also been trying to pry itself from the Middle East and focus its attention on Russia and China. But its biggest ally in the region, Benjamin Netanyahu, is determined to not let them do that. He appears to want to keep pulling the US into an ever-escalating conflict, hoping that the threat of US military action is enough of a deterrence to stop any regional actor from even thinking of challenging Israel. And so far, it seems to be going his way. And while the US says it's working hard to try and bring the violence in Gaza to an end, it's also providing Israel with $40 billion worth of bombs, weapons, and military infrastructure to carry on its fight. So while Biden says this, I'm more aware than you might know, and I'm comfortable with them stopping. We should have a ceasefire now. His defense secretary says this, Agreeing on the necessity of dismantling attack infrastructure along the border to ensure that Hezbollah cannot conduct October 7th style attacks on Israel's northern communities. So which is it, ceasefire or military action? It seems that the US, like Israel and like Iran, is escalating to de-escalate. Except they don't want to put it that way. No, you, we have certainly seen Iran, or sorry, we've certainly seen Israel expand the nature of its 
attacks against Hezbollah, but is a very diff is a very different type of attack than what we saw today from a state a state actor against another state. Meanwhile, the whole region is a matchbox that is catching fire, and its leaders are armed to the teeth, playing with the lives of millions of ordinary people held hostage. So, what will it take for this long-awaited de-escalation to arrive, or is it already too late?